You know, when we were looking at the films for the selection, we looked at this and we thought this was such an extraordinary meal film and such an extraordinary performance of a New York character. I just want to ask a couple of questions and then I'll throw it open. Um, or the first two films you directed had large action or thriller components. Did they? Yeah. I didn't notice. But... You didn't notice. He's really ornery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember any action sequence in any The Messenger? No? Uh, emotional action, sure. I thought of it as a, a kind of thrill, but okay. okay. But this is a very inward film compared to those films. And so, when you conceived it, did you conceive it specifically for this actor? That's always the easiest question for me, because uh, I, I didn't conceive this film. Richard Beer came to me with the idea of this film. And so, this is the part where I just pass it over to him. There's a long version, in the I'm going to give you the short version of this. So there, there was a script that um, uh, came to me, and I lose track, it might have been 10 years ago. And it was an interesting script, and it was dealing with a subject that I'm particularly concerned with, and I've been dealing with a group called the Coalition for the Homeless for a long time in New York. And it turns out the script was actually written in the late 80s, but it was still totally relevant 10 years ago. I couldn't get it out of my mind, and I ended up buying the script, and I had a sense of what I wanted to do with this film, but I, I couldn't quite get it there. And this is the short version of it. And we, we ran into each other. We've been friends from I'm Not There, about them, or in the you know. And I said, you know, we met each other at a, at a, at a new uh, Academy members drink. At, uh, where was it? at the Stone Rose, I know because I had a lot of time to kill when I came here today, so I checked it out, the Stone Rose. So we, anyway, we, we saw each other, that's what we're doing, what we're doing, I said, and then I had this script on my mind, I said, I have this script, and I'm looking for someone like Oren Moverman to do it, and, uh, but he would never do it because he's too busy, and I'm talking to him, so he said, let's send it, and well, let's talk about it, so. I sent it to him, and, and he responded. I had ideas over the years that had occurred to me of how to turn this script that didn't work into something that had some real jewels. And there was a, there was a book by a guy named Cadillac Man, was a homeless man, who uh, it, it was a very um, unschooled autobiography of someone who really wonderful talent and just was able to communicate his his world and with um, great peasant poetry and um, with no sense of self-pity about it. It was very dry in that sense. And it was beautiful. And I knew that that was the way they should feel. So we started talking about this from, from that point of view and neorealism and and our references of, of really being, have a very attuned bullshit barometer as we uh, approach this material. So, it, and at that point, it really came together quite quickly and naturally. I mean, there were no, no bumps in the road leading up to, to shooting this thing. It was just, it fell into place. We were so much on the same wavelength that it was really quite easy. Yeah, we started going to homeless shelters. Um, Richard introduced me to Kyle after we met with the instructor because there was a tone and energy to it that made me feel ordinary, even though it was an extraordinary story. And then going to homeless shelters, and Richard's been involved in the Polish for the homeless, and has been to homeless shelters before, and he actually had the perspective of how it was 15 years ago. Yeah, how it changed over 10 years, and, yeah. and uh, how like, the stories that I had from what I'd seen before, and people knew how it changed also. But what, what I wasn't clocking until he actually gave me his first draft uh, of, the, of the piece is that 
Orin had this incredible sense of, of the process being the movie. And this is an people don't do that anymore. Is that the actual process of living, the process of going through bureaucracy is enough plot. You don't need to pump it up with anything else. Life itself, uh, without any dramaturgy, is enough. And uh, so he, he was picking up things, little dialogue and, and situational stuff that are directly into the movie now from those first meetings that we had in the shelters. Which is another way of saying I stole most of the stuff. You stole all of it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have uh, a kind of actor question. Um, I'll take that one. <laughs> director question. Um, did you have lots of different possibilities to the tone of each scene? And did you try them on camera? Because it is so subtle the way it walks this line between the guy is really pretty much lost it and pulls himself out of it and loses a little bit more and pulls himself a little further back. And that's the extraordinary thing to watch. It, um, look, this is Oren's movie. And if this has quality, it's because Oren brought the quality to it. This is the best sense of what a director does. He, he picked very carefully all the talent to be in this movie, behind the camera as well as on camera, and he knew how to bring out the absolute best in everyone. Uh, and that's, that's, if you can't do that as a director, don't, don't begin, don't even start. My, my instinct is to argue with it, but I like the way it sounds, so. <laughs> so what, I think we were very much on the same wavelength of how to do this from the beginning, so there wasn't a struggle of this, you know, thousands of different ways of doing these scenes that felt they were fresh and that we didn't rehearse a lot. Um, the way we shot, you might want to talk about why you arrived at this, but we were on extremely long lenses, as you could tell in this film. The footprint of the filmmakers was very far away. And the people who are in the streets of New York did not know they were being, I shouldn't say this, but they did not know they were being filmed. No, they knew they were being filmed, but they didn't read. They didn't read the sandwich board. Because there was no camera visible. But there's no one recognizing you? Yeah, this was the one. This was one of the most bizarre things about this. Um, well, let me go back to what Oren brought to this. We, we were totally on the same wavelength, and we still are about this film. The first cut he showed me was like, okay, that was the movie I hoped that we had made. And I was thinking about this 10 years ago, so it, for me it was a miracle. Um, Oren has a real bizarre sense of time on, on film. He doesn't feel rushed. He doesn't care about cutting. It's not what he does. He just wants us to be in the movie with these people, and he doesn't want to manipulate them in any way whatsoever. And I'm quite aware of two hours in storytelling. And he kept telling me, slow down. You don't have to rush through this. You know, if I was picking up things off the ground, I remember the first time was when, when you know, I'd left my bag outside because I was drunk, and they threw me out of the building, and my stuff was dumped all over the street. And, you know, I, I played the scene and I went over and I got my stuff and I felt like, well, this, there was something that was going, this is going to be boring to just pick it up slowly. So I'm rushing it to get it back in my bag. And so I said, take your time. Well, the one it takes, it takes. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. All right, so that's how we're going to do this. All right. Okay, then I started to get intoxicated with this other sense of time also. And I think that's what's one of the intoxicating things, mesmerizing things about this film, is this, it's definitely on its own time. Uh, where time kind of, in fact, doesn't become a factor anymore. We, we're just there with this guy. Well, it's called time out of mind. Time out of mind. <laughs> Let's throw this open. Uh, Jim? Uh, Thank you very much for this film. I, I'm deeply moved. Jen, 
Uh, thank you very much for this film. I'm deeply moved. Uh, the three relationships in the film, which really rooted in the personal as, as opposed to the awful day-to-day -day life of anyone in this system, the one with the man in the shelter, uh, with wonderful Ben Vereen casting him in that role, uh, the one with the daughter, and Sheila with Kira. Could you talk about how you walk this path without making it sentimental or romantic? Those relationships. I mean, there's, there's no sophisticated answer to that. I mean, you just walk this path without it being romantic. Um, it was ordinary. It was, it was people living their lives. And we, we always approach this film as just, uh, you know, an exercise, an exercise in compassion, an exercise in perspective and compassion. And we shot it, obviously, you've noticed it uh, through store windows, through apartments, through rooftops, uh, always something getting in the way because it was a, we wanted it to be a real New York movie, which was about perspective. So are you going to get the perspective on something that is happening, unfolding outside your window to give yourself an opportunity for compassion, for recognizing somebody else? We're all incredibly busy in our lives and we all, uh, you know, kind of don't look up from our hands holding devices that are communicating with us. And so we wanted to make a movie that you notice when we look up from the cell phone you know. And um, it was just that. It was just very simple, very human, very much. Everyone came, you know, it was not a glamorous exercise. It was really um, just bare bones, low budget. You know, Richard was sitting in a rented car in between takes. Uh, but then you put Candy Says in the background of this very intense emotional scene. Yeah, and, and it was about listening to New York, it was about watching New York. We were obviously really influenced by the photography of Soul Lighter. As you probably noticed, the camera doesn't dolly or track until the very end of the movie, so it's all about creating these, you know, <laughs> postcards or, or a series of photographs uh, in which the city moves around one person and nobody notices them. And the shocking thing about it, if you want to take it, you know, to extra film perspective is, is that this, this someone, this nobody, uh, is Richard Gere, who is, I think it's fair to say, quite famous. Um, <laughs> so it was really about going into New York and getting that sense of the guy on the corner uh, that you don't notice and maybe we can make a movie about him. Uh, and everything had to do with that. We shot this whole movie on only three lenses. Uh, they were quite big lenses, but uh, we were hiding all the time. And we were creating this soundscape that was, um, you know, you know Liz Weiss is sitting over there and she was my teacher when I went to work in college and she kind of taught, taught me a lot about sound. And uh, mm -hmm. it was about listening to the city and watching it and creating these very simple situations where these people are just human, nobody's bad, there's no, no bad guys, there's no bad guy. And we talked about it when we went to homeless shelters and we talked to guards and we talked to people who were in the shelters and it would be too easy to create some sort of drama where you know somebody does something wrong and you can judge them for it. But we, we kind of took judgment out of it and we tried to be as compassionate and as human as possible about telling the story. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Roger Costa from Brazilian Press. Congratulations for the work. I have a question for the director. Uh, the use of the, the background voices in the early, early in the beginning of the movie, the, we can never listen to the main character, but we're always listening to other people's conversations. So I'd like to know what was your intention with that. And for Mr. Gear, I just want you to tell me, for your ladies' fans, if you ever had a Brazilian affair, <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with this? You've been a sex symbol for so many years. Ladies all over the world love you. That is a fun question. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't answer that one. was a sex symbol. Actually, my first, my first real girlfriend was Brazilian. And she still was a friend of mine. Define real. <laughs> and it was a long time, like six, seven years, and I was a young, a young man at that point. But she was, that's my Brazilian experience. She lived in, uh, in Bajé, 
inside the prison. We brought you to see. And uh, I have wonderful memories of her that I'm not going to share with you. <laughs> <laughs> My first girlfriend I married. <laughs> <laughs> Sound, yeah. I mean, we were creating, you know, 3D sound, basically. I mean, we were, this is the first movie I shot in New York. Um, it was one of the things that, that I, I produced the movie too, but it was one of the few things that we said, we got to spend whatever the money is to get great sound. And, and that was part of the design that Art had very from the beginning. I mean, we were basically making a silent movie. And from this character's perspective, it's, 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 it's not words. In his, in his mind, it's it's space, and the only thing that penetrates that space is sound. And many of us in the city feel the same way. I mean, if, you, if you ever stopped and focused on the sound around this, it's just a cacophony. It's stories within stories within stories. So uh, it was always part of his design. It wasn't an afterthought. It was designed that way. Yeah, I mean, this this is for me. This is the way I hear. The city, and I think a lot of us do um, when we pay attention. It's really, we wanted to do everything that most people who shoot in New York take out of the movie. You know, they want clean sounds so they can work with it and they can manipulate it and just add whatever they wanted. We wanted it to be dirty. We wanted it to be the feeling of being in New York and you're walking down the street and you have fragments of conversations and you have dramas happening everywhere. We have lives being lived everywhere. And that was part of the a non-judgmental approach of this movie, which is like everybody's fighting a great battle. I mean, like, is the, who was that say, the player, be kind for everyone is fighting a great battle? I mean, it's, the, we wanted it to be a movie that feels like New York, that has that particular kind of sound that is um, rich, but actually kind of insane, because if you do walk down the street, as I did after we finished shooting, I, I walked around with a bunch of other people and we recorded um, secretly, covertly, we recorded people talking, and it's in the movie. Um, it's all these conversations of real New Yorkers. Um, and I apologize if everyone can even recognize the German voice. So we, we really kind of drew on um, what New York sounds like, and, and it's the sound of being busy. It's the sound of living your own life and not really recognizing other people who are in parallel, other people who are living these great dramas around the corner. And I'm one of those people, I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm not accusing anyone of, of living their lives and not noticing that around the corner there's a long line of men trying to get into a shelter, or there's a long line of, you know, of women and children trying to get into a shelter. I didn't recognize it. I, I was living really close to Bellevue for a long time, and I never saw that line until we actually went to Bellevue. And we actually ended up shooting in the, the old movie, which that's the antics and the performance man. And we just wanted that feeling. So like, you can notice whatever you want. You can listen to something else and not really watch what's in the movie. There were a couple of times when we did friends and family screenings. And when I introduced the movie, I said, keep yourself on home. If you get a call, take it. Um, just keep <laughs> being engaged in your life and see how this movie fits into it because we're asking people to watch something that they don't really want to watch in their everyday lives, because they can't. You can stop next to a homeless person and start talking to them, and you'll get a, a full story. You know, most of them really would want to talk to you. Obviously, there's different stages of mental illness and addiction and problems and all that kind of stuff, but these are all stories happening around us, and we're really lucky to be focusing on one story and making it as real as we can within a fiction movie. So it was really about just creating a sound that feels in the place and, and feels as real, you know, as much as real can fit into the movie um, in, in this particular work. Hi, uh, Dean Treadway, Movie Geek and I am. Uh, great movie, <coughs> uh, Mr. Newton. Uh, I want to ask you about your visual design of the film. Uh, uh, you know, shooting through glass, lots of things. Uh, obscuring uh, our, our vision, and uh, what was your what was your thought process behind that? And also, uh, Mr. Keir, um, in your many years of researching this role, uh, how have you seen the our treatment of the homeless actually 
uh, change over the years? So, I mean, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Uh, uh, well, what are the different different qualities today um, that you found changing over the years? Well, my part, my part of the question is easy. Uh, we we really studied the photography of Soul Lighter. Uh, Bobby Wachowski, who I work with, um, and we get a chance to direct, um, and I really only talk about photography when we talk about movies. We don't really talk about movies. Uh, we start with photographs and we start looking at them. What we liked about the photography of Soul Lighter, who was uh, you know, uh, one of the pioneers of the New York School of Photography, it is um, these frames where sometimes you don't know what the subject of the frame is. You capture New York in such a um, true layered way where you can see reflections, you can see various layers of angles in New York and what you know New York feels like when you're looking through a store window or you're looking through um, any other kind of obstacle. So we really talked about being very still on zoom lenses because I'm obsessed with zooms. And and really just finding Richard in these tableaus and in, in these environments where we're moving around him and we're isolating him because this is the story that we're telling. Um, and as I said, the, the idea of this movie is, it's, it's really two words. I mean, I try to make, I'm, I'm a very simple person, so I try to make things very simple. Um, it was really about perspective and impact. And really about, as I said, having the perspective that we all have every day when we're living our lives and doing our thing to, um, to give us up the possibility of noticing someone else in a different situation and having the possibility of feeling something cool. And that's it. We're not trying to, I mean, we wish we could, but we're not trying to solve homelessness. We don't have the answers. We have one story, one person. And um, the idea of shooting through windows was the idea of, of finding the reflections, finding the rest of New York, moving around this character and, and finding our relationship with the character. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what you asked. It's about how homelessness has yeah, changed how the experience you, yeah, you're, over the last 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Well, you know when the, the script, the original script in the 80s was written before a law was enacted, which kind of codified how homeless people had to be treated and the services that had to be provided. So that was a radical change. There was no longer uh, war memorials uh, for large uh, uh, industrial buildings were, you know, so dormitories of hundreds of people. Uh, it, it, it was clear that there had to be a bed, there had to be a, a locked bureau next door of metal, and, and, and food had to be provided at certain times and on certain volume, etc. So that, there was a minimum that's in place now. Um, but the quality of that doesn't change because these are really interior things. It's, it's what it feels like. To be homeless. And that, that hasn't changed at all in this process. And how quickly one descends into really scary zones of consciousness. Like we're going to be visibility. I kind of yeah. And it's worse, I keep telling people it's, it's actually worse than being invisible. It's a black hole that everyone's afraid to get sucked into. You, 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 you are, you're radiating failure being homeless on the street. No one wants to come here. Mm -hmm. And for me, the, the profundity of my experience doing this, you know, the first day we, we did a, we were going to test day to see if this was going to work at Master Place, and, and uh, the, the camera was in the, uh, the Starbucks thing. No one on the street could see the camera. But I'm out there, first time to see if this is going to work. And, I'm still making movies, I'm still out there. You know, so I was a little scared, actually, and anxious about, one as a filmmaker, but personally, that I would be that naked out there on the streets. No one paid any attention to me. No one saw me. You had the cut. I had the cut. I, mean, I started talking after a while. We, I mean, we went on for 45 minutes shooting this thing straight. We, we shot digitally in a very long take sometimes. And I started a bit of approaching people, not harassing them, but just approaching them. Can you help me out? Spare chain. Can you help me out? Spare chain. No eye contact. Even when someone gave me a dollar bill, no eye contact. Uh, it, 
that, that to me was the first time I've, I've really felt inside of what that is. And for me, look, I come here and you want to hear what I have to say. You've seen my movie. I'm iconic in some way. And it's romantic in some way. I'm the same guy on the street. And no one wanted to hear it. No one wanted to hear his story. So for me, it's a profound experience of existentialism. Of how relative it all is. All of it. Existence itself. And certainly consciousness. Over here in the middle, Robin Milling, Milling about when I hear. This is somewhat of a follow up, Richard, to what you're just discussing. How far did you go, or would you go? Did you sleep on the streets ever? Did you spend any time in the shelters with some of the real men? Yeah, no, I visited a lot of the shelters, and over the last, I was trying to tell you, again, eight or ten years of doing that. And Felt like it was something that I knew, uh, sort of the details I was picking up. But instinctively, I don't think it's that hard for us to get there. I think we all have a yearning to be known, to be seen. Um, and I think that's why we didn't know this film was going to work on any level when we did this. We just went whole hog with what we decided to do. But I think when people, when I moved when I'm watching this, it's that sense of yearning. I'm not. I'm not seeing this guy as a homeless guy in the movie. I'm seeing him as us. They were all yearning for love, for affection, for to be seen, to be embraced, to be part of all those things. And it, it certainly is highlighted and it's very clear in a homeless person. Um, albeit we see substance abuse, we see mental illness, we see all these things that are part of that population. But I also can see how quickly we all can descend into that territory when we are totally cut loose in all of our connections to people of love and affection and, and just general well, being well thought of. That kindness of someone looking and smiling and thinking, oh, we should have this. These guys don't get that. And how quickly this other thing starts to happen that is dark and Lost, deeply lost. Ellis Messier from Theater Life. I was just, the casting of Kara Sedgwick and Ben Vereen is brilliant. Is the script totally scripted or was there a lot of ad libbing, especially with Ben? It was all scripted and then, you know, I, I always hesitate about, you know, executing the script. I, I really try to, you know, I think most of my job is casting. And, uh, Find the right people who will take over the role, and then at that point, they know more than more about the character, and then they will bring whatever they can to it. And Kira read the script, and actually, um, that whole those three scenes where she's talking and telling her story, they were not in the script. She um, wanted to play this woman. She wanted to transform, and she went out and started talking to people. Um, in that world, she talked to homeless women, and she came back with a lot of notes. And I basically, being the, the chief that I am, I, I took those notes and wrote uh, that monologue uh, that we chopped up into three scenes. Uh, but that was all taken from someone, you know, she did the homework. She, well, she talked to the people, and she wanted to play a particular woman that she met, and that became the role. And I was excited by her enthusiasm, her ownership of, of that role and what it could be. Ben Breen, we sent him the script, we had that role in the script, and um, I was, it was sent to a bunch of people, and I thought we'll have a conversation, and the next thing I know, he, I was told he's coming to New York to meet me. Uh, so I told Richard that Ben Green was insisting on coming. I talked about it, I didn't know what it was about. He showed up with a suitcase, he was in the middle of rehearsals for another, uh, uh, for a, a show that he was doing in LA. And he just showed up and he basically sat down, he sat in the office, and he just said, I need to make this movie, and here's why. And he told him why it was clear that he needed to make this movie for his own personal reasons. And he had a way of connecting with this character. It was incredibly personal, and that he read some scenes for us, and we looked at them, and we decided, you know, that's, that's the guy. So it was a very uh, kind of organic process of, of people showing up and saying, you know, let me do it. Um, you want to be a part of it. Steve Buscemi read the script. We, Steve's been in uh, 
some of my action films. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a good friend, he read the script and he said, like, right, I should play that guy. And I said, well, it's not very, I mean, I think it's a good role. It's you know, I'm involved with this, but it's not the most rewarding thing. It's like, no, it's, it's part of the whole. So everyone had a really good attitude about it. Being in service of the movie and in service of what the movie was about. So it was, it, it was quite beautiful the way it, it was a kind of gathering of a dysfunctional family. Uh, hi, Velvet Wright, Velvet's Pen. Uh, congratulations to you both on the film. Uh, question for Richard. Um, maybe my imagination just sort of went off the rails, but most of the time I was watching the film, I was thinking about Julian Kay. Could you compare and contrast? those two characters, the one from American Gigolo and this character? Quick, quick compare and contrast. That's a really bizarre one. Take the two transport. Wow. You're really leaping on that one, man. What, uh, let me see, what can I do with that? It was the pumpkin cake. It? In the mind of Paul Schrader. Can you talk about persona? Yeah, well, we, it's, it is funny, you probably didn't know this, but that Paul's, the genesis of American Gigolo was the pit puppet of Bresson, and which is also, that was a movie about, about procedure. How do you pick a pocket? You know, what does a pickpocket do? Is really what the film was. And that came from Dostoevsky. So there is a certain line here of just seeing what, what do people do in terms of what their job or their situation is, not in terms of plot, but seeing character in terms of just what they do. What does the homeless guy do? And I, when you talk about this, what is the plot of this movie? Well, the guy only asks for two things. I need a place to sleep and I'm hungry. That's all he asks in the service scene. I need a place to sleep, I'm hungry. Jigolo was asking for something else. <laughs> in that sense, you know, again, it was about procedure. We saw, I think, I haven't seen that movie in a long time, but I don't really know anything about how did Jigolo do his thing. Um, I do, I forget where it was, but it was in Toronto, they showed those clips of, I think they showed a long clip of that movie. I barely recognized myself in that movie. Uh, it's ever so long ago, it was 35 years ago or more. I'm stretching, there's nothing else to do. He <laughs> <laughs> well, got out of prison and then he got lost and moved to New York and had a child. It's worth it. Any more questions? Um, Josh Marston, friend of the court. Um, congratulations, both. Uh, uh, brilliant movie that is quite beautiful. And I think one of the things that enables it to be so beautiful is that you're incredibly specific with the character. And I have no doubt that in writing this, I'm over here, I'm in the middle. Oh, thank you. Um, I have no doubt that you, or I imagine that you had a very detailed and specific biography of this character. Both of you. No. And no, actually, no. Absolutely not. No, in fact, I, we, we decided in the process of, of writing and rewriting and thinking about this movie that we wanted to remove that story. We put enough in to kind of hold on to the relationship between me and Ben in the movie. So there was a, there, there was, he was gifted with some of my backstory. Because he was my friend. Not because I knew, either of us needed the audience to know the backstory. In this case, we, the, in our own lives, we make judgments on people without knowing anything about it. About how they look, about how much money it looks like they have, maybe we can tell, we, we posit education, we posit you know, where they might live, or where they come from, very quickly, without any real information. And I think that's really what we were doing. Was, okay, let's just present a guy here. And he's a Rorschach test for everyone of what he is. It, the original script had him, I think, a little more specific about where he was coming from economically and you know, the job he had lost and ended up on the street. I had no interest in that whatsoever, and Oren didn't either. 
Um, again, this was a, and we wanted to make this film a much more intuitive way. Like life. There's very little in our lives that we're really planning out. Although I must tell you, there's one, there's one interesting thing I found out. There was, it, I think there may have been two or three times people talked to me on the street. Once was a French tourist woman who just totally thought that I was a homeless guy, gave me some food. The other two times were African Americans. And they just passed me and went, hey Rich, how you doing, man? <laughs> No question in my mind what I was doing there. I've fallen on hard times. I'm not here. Just, hey, Rich, how you doing, man? Continue on. White guys, white people, we're very much in our capsules. We think about, we get from here and we know where we're going to, and we see very little in between here and there. African Americans are much more in the moment. Kind of see the world around them for whatever reason. Um, so that was a very interesting part of this process too. But in general, psychology backstory not interesting to us in this moment. But we did we did talk about well not really talk about but we did develop some like sort of an emotional backstory. We sort of knew how what's the range or the spectrum in which emotion we were in it seems. Oh, really yeah, well, we knew where it was all the time, but it wasn't about communicating where it came from. Or the, the t it makes it too easy with a character like this. You have to live with them. And therefore, I think, again, what I was saying before, it's not like I don't believe we're seeing a homeless guy by the end of this. We're seeing ourselves, our emotional naked selves, and that, that, that yearning that we all share, all of us. Some of us more dramatically than others, but that's, boy, that's our common denominator right there. That will to belong, to be seen, to be embraced. You know, I mean, for me, that was an amazing choice then, because it's so against the rules not to have a character backstory. But my relationship to the movie was, gee, if this could happen to each other, it could happen to anyone. So it was so much you in that situation and not with the character in between. That's what I thought was so extraordinary. Yeah, that's, that's the social experiment component of it. We didn't know we were going to have until that day we shot it at Hanley and asked the place. Yeah, we were reluctantly thinking of plan B if it didn't work. Because, you know, it, seriously, the whole thing was predicated on that for a lot of this movie, I would be on the streets. And New York would be passing me by, behaving if I was who I was supposed to be. But if that didn't work, I don't even know what it would have done. Thank you both so much. Thank you all.